What are the other factors that are in play here that make investing in EMs different? It's a tricky question because personally, I don't think there's that much difference. We all trying to have a better assessment and more complete assessment of risk. And this is why wearing a sustainable lens in analyzing opportunity is important. Welcome to Well Said, conversations with Wellington management investment professionals about the intersection of financial markets, geopolitics, and long-term investment research. I'm your host, Thomas Mucha. Today's topic is sustainable finance in emerging markets. 2022 has obviously seen its challenges, from a war in Ukraine that's roiling commodity and other markets, to deepening geopolitical strains between the U.S., China, and other countries around the world, including, of course, many EMs. Then, of course, we've seen inflation, shifts in global monetary policy, a deeply uncertain global macro backdrop, and a series of climate-related disasters around the world. So, in this increasingly complex backdrop, what are the risks and rewards of sustainable finance? I'm joined today by my friend and colleague, Sam Epibunya, a fixed income credit analyst here at Wellington who specializes in Africa and Latin America in particular. Sam, welcome to Well Said. Thank you, Thomas. Really happy to be here. Glad you're here. So let's start with this intersection between emerging markets and sustainable finance. So the market for this in EMs is exploding. What do you think is driving this growth? Is this investor demand? Is it shifts in the regulatory backdrop? Is it appreciation of the risks of climate change? I mean, what's behind this? I would say all the above. The reality is EM is, in my view, disproportionately impacted by climate change. I grew up in West Africa in a country called Côte d'Ivoire or Ivory Coast. And when you talk to my parents, in their generation alone, they've seen sort of the negative impact from climate risk, right? There's places where they used to fish that no longer exist. Population have been displaced. And today, for example, you see flooding in Pakistan, extreme drought in parts of Africa. We again worry about famine in Ethiopia, for example. I think addressing climate adaptation, making sure that economic prosperity is prevalent is important. And I think this is why wearing a sustainable lens as investor to ensure we can allocate capital to places that need the most is not only the right thing to do, but I think it's also a great investment opportunity. So a lot of factors driving this growth, as you point out, happening all over the world. Where is all the green capital going? I mean, what are the the types of projects that are being funded? That's a very good question. I think what we've witnessed so far is that a lot of capital is actually going to, not surprisingly, renewable energy. I would also say climate adaptation. You see some capital going to transition as well. Let's say, for example, you are a Chilean utility. Most of your energy was coming from thermal typically coal. And what they're trying to do now is to invest in more renewable and essentially transitioning the country's energy metrics towards a greener energy source. So as you say, climate change is front and center in a lot of these countries. The investment dollars are flowing in those directions. I'm curious, though, from your credit analysis perspective, with this sustainable uh, focus that you have, how does this differ from developed markets? I mean, what are the other factors that are in play here that make investing in EMs different? It's a tricky question because personally, I don't think there's that much difference. We all trying to have a better assessment and more complete assessment of risk. And this is why wearing a sustainable lens in analyzing opportunity is important. 
always worry about the downside and having a clear sense of all the risk involved in a certain opportunity allow you to better price it. And so from that perspective, I don't think it's that different. Now, if you ask me if there's additional risk in EM, of course, political risk, and you mentioned climate as well. I mean, this is not just EM, but I would say in EM, a bit more pronounced. So that sustainable lens gives you a clearer way to, to assess risks and opportunities. I would say clearer and more complete. More quantitative. As well. To be honest with you, I I don't think it's that different from how we've been analyzing companies in EM for a long time. Governance was always part of the picture, assessing environmental risk. As you know, Thomas, a lot of those countries and companies are involved in primary economic activity, i.e. mining, oil and gas. And I would say the social, in my view, is always being part of the equation because if you're a miner, let's say in Chile, you need the social license from the communities to be able to operate. Now I have to confess that 10 years ago, a lot of the companies didn't quite understand that. I kept telling them, you know, when I visited companies in Bogota in Colombia or in Santiago in Chile or Lima in Peru, what struck me was the inequality that you see, right? So you have a rich company operating and you see the surrounding and you're like, okay, guys, you can can do a better job. And their view was, it's not our responsibility, it's the responsibility of the government. And I always had a different view. I felt like you need to be more responsible as an economic operator in the region, investing a couple million dollars in a school so that your staff can send their children to a, a school nearby. To me, it's good investment as well. Well, given this increased focus on ESG, and it's a global uh, mm-hmm. phenomenon, obviously, are there any examples where you feel like companies have gotten the message on this? I would say things have improved the last three or four years, especially in Latin and Africa. I have to say half of the companies I was talking to five years ago, when you bring those topics, they will just be literally clueless. Now, I think there's a better appreciation of the importance of those factors for a couple of reasons. One is that investor care. And two, they realize that if they don't improve their standards along those dimensions, not only will they run the risk of having capital move away from them, but two is that their own operation could be at risk. I can give you one well-known and publicized example, which is that of Vale, which is a leading iron ore producer in Brazil, one of the largest in the world. And in the last seven years, they had two major incidents. In 2015, San Marco, which is a major disaster that led to the death of 19 people. And then more tragically was in 2019, It was the Brumadinho, essentially a dam failing that resulted in the death of close to 300 people, including 270 staff of Valley. And when you analyze kind of what went wrong, I think the company was exclusively focusing on production, cash flow, and in my view, less emphasis on safety and kind of their social and environmental standards. And that has changed, right? Unfortunately, it cost a lot of lives and almost $16 billion, a huge number in terms of impact. And of course, the company's market cap suffer because of that. What I can tell you now is that they've made some efforts, right? So they're improving their board governance, the management team. But more importantly is that the regulation in Brazil has changed as well compelling companies to basically decommission this type of upstream tailings are the ones that have been failing. It's not just Valley, but all the miners that have upstream tailings have to decommission those. But I think finally, some of those miners understand the importance of environmental and social standards in their operation. And then management now incentivize to adhere to more stricter sort of rules. Sam, I want to dig a little bit deeper into your background, your research process, how you got to where you are today. 
You mentioned earlier that you know you come from West Africa. You've seen firsthand some of the impacts of these changes. So how, first of all, how does that, that personal experience inform the way that you look at this industry or this development? And then how does that translate into your research process? Growing up in Africos, which is a beautiful country, and, and I was blessed to, to grow up in a wonderful family and very privileged. But inequality is there. And I was always interested in understanding how capital could help improve a company's prospect. Because my view was anything you want to achieve, you need capital. Better health care, <laughs> you need money to make this happen. Better infrastructure, you need money. And how do you better allocate and make sure that money is used in an efficient way, but also that you're providing incentive for people to come, right? Because when you think about the Ivory Coast versus neighboring country, we were act- attracting more investment than Burkina Faso, for example, in the north, even Mali. And that ties to the other point I made earlier about climate, right? Already those countries that are drier were seeing less capital. And that exacerbated the issue, right? Because people are less opportunity and they actually migrated towards Côte d'Ivoire. And so I was always thinking about orienting my career, a place where I could be part of a solution, right? To allocate capital to places that need it the most. So I've been blessed the last 20 years I've been involved in EM and part of investment and allocating capital to those countries and those companies. So you're seeing fruits of that labor. It took a long time. I had a winding path towards investment management. A lot of us have, Sam. Exactly, I know. So Sam, in your research process, you know, what teams do you talk to? Who do you collaborate with? You know, how does the Wellington research ecosystem inform your your views on sustainability, on ESG, on geopolitics? Having had the privilege to work in different places, I can compare and contrast. And by far, Wellington has been the best in terms of collaboration. And I can tell you that in my humble view, it's our secret sauce, and I always tap into it. I would say, honestly, collaborate a lot with the ESG team, the global industry analyst, and of course, our equity colleagues. So maybe I'll give you one example to illustrate this. I would say a few weeks back, we met the chairman of the board of a large mining company. And around the table on the Wellington side was the ESG analyst, an equity portfolio manager, a global industry analyst, and me as a credit analyst. And why that's important? One is because we hold the company accountable. So I've been in many meetings where the company can tailor their message depending on the audience. So when they talk to the equity colleagues, they'll talk about growth and dividend payments. And when they talk to me, they'll be like, no, it's all about balance sheet management and being prudent. And when they talk to the ESG analysts, they they emphasize their very careful management of their mining operation and the health and safety standard that they've improved. But when you have everyone on the table, they have to be, I would say, more truthful in my view because they they can't tailor their message to one particular audience. So you've surrounded them with knowledge. Not only with knowledge, but also very good question and we all learn from each other. But I would say where the power of of Wellington resides it's is through that collaboration. And I would say the companies themselves respect us for that. Just in the case of that mining company, you know, after the chat and after being grilled by us because we wanted to ensure that at least on the governor's side, they were making progress, actually ask us for input in terms of what should they consider in terms of criteria for their board. And we put them in touch with folks internally that spend a lot of time on governance and board composition. So uh, to me, it's, it highlights this collaboration, but the fact that we can, in all modesty, positively influence companies in the right way through that collaboration. So I want to get back to the the markets that are the the key area of your focus. So you've been covering issuers in Latin America and Africa for a long time, as you just said. How do you think those markets have changed over that period? And what do you expect the next 20 years are likely to bring in terms of 
you know, sustainability and development? A very good question. I'm involved in the fixed income market and specifically emerging market debt. And if you look at LATAM in Africa, they represent about a third of the asset class. So I continue to see growth in those places, but there's challenges ahead. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of those economies are still focused on primary activities, and that worries me. So a lot of mining, a lot of oil and gas. The last 10, 15 years, what has been a good sign is that there's been more emphasis on technology, right? So you've seen the emergence of solid telecom operators. You have cell towers companies. You have fiber optics companies. So I think slowly but surely you have companies that are, in my view, getting into the 21st century, right? So I see this slow progress towards a service-oriented world, but we have to be honest, even the new world will require some copper, some special metals, some oil. We have to be realistic that even that transition is going to require some oil. And I think LATAM and Africa will still be involved in providing those services and products to the world. There's a lot of dirty activity on the way to a cleaner future, given how we get there. Absolutely. And but one important point I want to make is that those companies realize they have to do it a cleaner way. So believe it or not, even the fossil fuel guys are saying, you know, I, we have to do it a less carbon intensive way. If that means having more renewable in our own processes, we'll do so. If there's way to capture some of the carbon that we're emitting, we're willing to make the investment. So I feel like a transition to a, a greener world, NEM, is possible, but it requires investment. I give the example of Chile, right? So Chile is a country in South America that, in my view, is the most committed to the Paris Accord, right? So the government has signed this accord. And the main takeaway was this carbon neutrality by 2050. Now, a lot of countries have stated similar goals, but in the end, Chile is one of the rare countries that actually is working really hard towards making it happen. And so they're forcing the utility companies to essentially transition away from coal. And they gave them until 2025. I think it's pretty aggressive. They may not get there, but there's pressure to do so. But more importantly, even the customers of those companies are being forced to procure the energy via renewable, right? If you're a miner in Chile, the government is saying, okay, your energy that you're procuring has to be clean. So they're making sure it's not just the utility, but the customer also get their energy from renewable sources. So I think it's a great sign and shows that EM can actually transform itself. So Sam, one of the themes that I'm picking up from this conversation is around change. You've mentioned policy change, regulatory change, technological change, uh, attitudinal yeah. changes. So as, as you're looking forward here, do you think these changes are likely to be incremental? Um, or do you think we're going to get wholesale transformations? Tough question. I honestly think it's going to be incremental. First of all, we have to understand that those countries are facing a lot of issues as we speak. Inflation, you know, it's a global phenomenon. But in EM, it's definitely impacting the lower segment. There are operating in, in countries where the high level of dissatisfaction with the es political establishment. And they are concerned that any abrupt change may disproportionately impact the lower segment of the economy. And because of that, they are worried about big changes. From a domestic political perspective, you mean social stability perspective? Even just on the economic front. So for example, if you pick a place like South Africa, yes, there's a lot of pressure for the country to become greener. But as you know, a lot of the source of energy in South Africa is coming from coal. And it's really challenging for them to overnight change that reality. 
So my view is that we have to be flexible. We want to spend more time with those countries and those companies and see, okay, is there a transition? Is there a path that we can be partners with those companies and those countries to make them get there, right, without too much disruption? Another example in Mexico is around oil and gas, right? Mexico produces close to 2 million barrels per day. Half of it is in crude, but the rest is not enough to satisfy the local economy. So their view is going away from fossil fuel is not necessarily workable. And they also have a large segment of the working population involved in the supply chain of, right? So when you have disruption, people are worried, like, what do I do with those folks? Where... It's not clear that you have the technology and the companies to absorb the recently displaced workers. The U.S. unemployment is, what, 5% or less, right? In those countries, double that. And among the youth, sometimes 20 25%. So the equation is harder to solve in the end. So disruption of society yep. is, is a, a key point here. This leads me to you know, my favorite topic, uh, the geopolitical and and macro environments. I think a lot of what's happening in the geopolitical backdrop, the macro backdrop today, um, is intersecting with sustainability and these ESG issues that we're talking about. Uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, of course, is leading to energy disruptions, uh, food shortages, uh, inflationary uh, impacts, uh, particularly among low-income populations, as Mm -hmm. you point out. So, you know, what are you paying attention to most right now on the macro side of things? No, excellent question. As EM investor, we worry a lot about political risk. And I'm not sure the West is fully aware of the new world that we're in. I would say the Russia influence in Africa has been surprising to me. And, you know, in my humble view, has been destabilizing in some regards. So when you think about a country like Mali that went from the French troops that were basically approved by the UN to now an unofficial security service from Russia as the guarantor of your security, it's problematic, especially because a lot of observers on the ground will tell you that the way they are compensated. I mean, this Russian security service that Mali has contracted is through in-kind mining rights. So that's problematic because what one day used to be yours may not be. And I think that's the risk in general with those type of arrangement because there's an opacity to them, which makes investment more challenging in my view. Hard to press that. Exactly. And to me, that highlights a global war effort. I don't think it's apparent to Western observer that Russia has been basically laying out is support across the world for a moment like this, because I was surprised to see, for example, after the Ukraine invasion, that the reaction in Africa was muted, because I expected, you know, as former country that would colonize, I think, in general, uh, don't necessarily see another big power invading a a smaller country as positive. But I think Russia has been essentially extending their propaganda beyond the West in corners of the world that a lot of people were not paying attention. And why does that matter? I think it matters because if you are trying to invest in those countries, you have to realize that now, more than ever, geopolitical risk has increased because you don't have the stability and the predictability of one actor like France or the US or the UK providing some form of backstop. Now you have actually tension between superpowers and actually that destabilizes those countries. So you have Russia versus the West versus the U.S. 
but also China versus the West and U.S. Well, you beat me to my question, which is obviously you and I talk a lot about great power competition. That's right. It's a global phenomenon. It's not only Russia, as you say. China is making inroads in both of your areas, right? Latin right. America and Africa. So I'm curious, how does this shifting geopolitical landscape, you know, this great power competition that's deepening, how does that play into your analysis? First of all, you need to be compensated for those risks. There are places in Africa that we tend to avoid because we think that the political risk, the security risk is too high. If you ask my colleague Matt Hildebrand that covers Nigeria on the sovereign, is worried that if the security issues in Nigeria are not dealt with very seriously, Nigeria could become a failed state. The northeast of the country is no man's land. The jihadists, including Boko Haram, is there. I would say three quarters of the GDP of the country is generated outside of those regions. So it's still durable to invest in Nigeria and, and make good returns. But is it sustainable? That's interesting. You, you point to political stability as a necessary factor in long-term investment. I'm not sure it's as well appreciated among the broader Wall Street community about how important political stability has been over the past, let's say, 30, 40 years when globalization was on the rise. We have a very different geopolitical backdrop now, right? We've got this increasing competition. We've got more political instability. You throw COVID on top of that. You throw the Russia war on top of this. You have all of these ripples. How do you think this geopolitical competition will play out in these areas? Do you think it'll be further destabilizing or will a more active China, a more active Russia provide some of the capital that you talked about earlier to be more stabilizing in these places? Unfortunately, I think it will be more destabilizing, at least in the short run, because when China and Russia and other regional or global powers are trying to establish their influence in a place, they want to displace the current protector, if you want. And in that process, you have a lot of destabilizing trends happening. And now that Russia wants to have a bit more influence in Latin America, sometimes via Cuba and Venezuela, you could see how that has destabilized a bit Colombia. And of course, you know, when you mentioned COVID, the economic malaise of the last few years, honestly, Thomas, when you go around EM, especially in Latin and Africa, I feel like it's a, a time bomb. I mean, you see that even in developed countries like the U.S., you feel like there's a, a brewing anger because inequality is increasing, social mobility is decreasing. Chile used to be kind of the model Latin EM country, it was one of the rare single-A country, admittedly A-, minus, so not A-, not a plus, but still in the A category. And now Chile is looking more and more like the rest of Latam. You had a s severe social unrest that led to a new government. The government tried to pass a constitutional change that failed. But to me, it illustrate the fact that there's almost a social fracture in a lot of those countries. And that makes investing more complicated. In Chile, for example, and in Peru as well, you've seen the obtention of license to mine becoming more contentious, more challenging, because those communities felt like they haven't had a fair share of the spoils. They used to protest, like I would say, in a civil manner, if you want. Now it's becoming more violent. So if you have mining investment, you have to be conscious of those risks. Before it was right, whether the government will expropriate your asset. Now it's simply whether you can operate the mine because workers will occupy it and sometimes they're armed. Yeah, it's, it's pretty clear that a destabilized society adds another layer of complexity to these geopolitical challenges, and they sort of feed on each other. That's right. So, Sam, let me end here with a couple questions about what you're reading, mm. how you research, how do you keep abreast of all of these changes. Do you have a book 
that's influenced you or could help this audience better understand some of these nuances that we've been discussing? To be honest with you, no book I can recommend. But one thing I love doing is reading The Economist. And what I liked about The Economist is that they tend to be, I wouldn't say neutral, but they will give you both sides of the arguments, right? So it's not as editorialized as other publication. And honestly, if you investing in Africa and LATAM, it's one of the few publications that would actually cover those and provide you with good analysis. And because it's a weekly, I feel like I can stay on top of this. That's the one I would highlight. They also have the best artwork every week. I always look forward to how they depict what's happening around the world. All right, last question, Sam. You mentioned you had a circuitous route to what you're doing. If you weren't doing what you're doing today, fixed income analyst at Wellington, what career would you like to have? Obviously, I'd love to be a very successful soccer player. (laughs) <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> Coming from the Ivory Coast and having one of our own, being a superstar at Chelsea Football Club in England, we always dream we could have uh, repeated what Didier Drogba did. You, dream big, Sam. Dream big. Yes. No, that would have been my biggest dream. But the reality is probably a career in venture capital focus on EM. But to be honest with you, I feel like I'm as close as that <laughs> being at Wellington. So I'm, I'm really happy and feel extremely bless. Well, the way the world is going, Sam, there's going to be plenty of opportunity to deploy capital in ways to make life better for a lot of people. So we're glad you're with us. Thanks for being here once again. Sam Epibunya, Fixed Income Analyst at Wellington. Thank you for having me. The Well Said Podcast is produced by Wellington Management. The executive producer is Kristen Ganong. Our senior producers are Mark Murphy, Dana Wickstead, and Colin Hopkins. Our sound engineer is Mark Murphy. This episode is mixed and edited by Mark Murphy. You can find this episode, as well as others, in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. All investing involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. Past results are not a reliable indicator of future results. Forward-looking statements should not be considered as guarantees or prediction of future events. This material was current as of the publication date. Wellington assumes no duty to update the content in the event that the information changes. This commentary is provided for informational purposes only. It is not research that is required to be prepared in accordance with legal requirements designed to promote the independence of investment research and it is not subject to any prohibition on dealing ahead of the dissemination of investment research. It should not be viewed as current or past recommendation and is not intended to constitute investment advice or an offer to sell or the solicitation of an offer to purchase any securities. It does not take into account the investment objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. Wellington Management does not provide legal, tax, or accounting advice. The views expressed are those of the speaker and may not reflect the views of others at Wellington. This recording may not be reproduced or distributed in whole or in part for any purpose without the express written consent of Wellington management. Please refer to the disclosure section of this podcast for complete details.